Hi folks, welcome to the channel. If you're a new or returning subscriber, please remember to like our videos, provide comments to help us with continuous improvement to our content, share with friends and family, and most importantly, subscribe. Thank you. So let's go beyond looking at uh, 2D forms and start looking at 3D forms. So let's have a look at the equation that I presented to you at the very beginning. So in terms of calculating the global coordinates in terms of x and y, that will be the sum of the first moments of area with respect to x or y divided by the total area of the entity. So let's assume that you're dealing with an object where it has uniform thickness. So we know that volume is equal to what? Volume is equal to area multiplied by the thickness. So we can then redefine these equations by multiplying the numerator and the denominator using t. So t defines the thickness or the depth of um, the object. So by doing so, it converts the formula in terms of calculating respect to the area, but now looking at calculated in terms of the volume of the components or the parts or the forms that constitutes uh, the composition of the composite shape. So this now progresses from 2D to 3D. However, we need to be very careful here because in this instance, if we have regular volumes constitutes a regular 3D forms constituting the form of a given product, we can only use this equation if all the components are made from the same material. So what if we have a situation whereby a component or an assembly is constituted of uh, parts made out of different materials? And this is where the next part comes into play. So if we think about the formula for density, what is the formula for density? The formula for density is equal to what? Mass divided by volume. So if we then transpose this equation by multiplying volume by density, that would then constitute what? The mass. So you can then calculate or predict the centroid in terms of the mass. If we have a situation where the assembly of a given product is constituted of um, uh, parts made out of different materials. So by multiplying the numerator and the denominator by the density of that specific um, component, that then defines this equation to enable us to calculate the center of mass uh, in terms of you know, the material that constitutes um, the material. So based on that, let's look at um, this example. So this is example two. So the first example, we looked at a laminar or a 2D shape or form. This time, we're going to apply similar concept in terms of calculating or predicting the centroid position for a 3D object. So how do we go about doing this? So let's look at this example here. So we've got this uh, 3D composite solid, and we're being told or challenged to calculate the central coordinates in terms of x, y, and z. Again, we need to be very wary, particularly for a given problem, where the defined reference axis has been placed. Okay, so for this axis here, we're being told that moving, you know, towards me, so moving away from um, the reference point, y is assumed to be negative. So the opposite direction will be positive. Going up, z will be positive, and moving rightwards from um, the bearing of the axis will be positive. 
If you give it some information in terms of the size of the object or the solid uh, composite, and this is the information that we've been given here. It's very important, and this is where a lot of students tend to make you know, silly mistakes. When you have a situation like this, it's best to look at the object from two perspectives. So here, look at the form in terms of Z respect to Y, and rotate it to look at the constitution of um, the object in terms of Z respect, uh, Z respect to X. And use that to identify where the central position will be. If you do that, you're more or less guaranteed of working this accurately. If you don't, then you're going to have a problem. So, again, make sure that you review the methodology you use here to ensure that you are on track when you are given a similar challenge. So this is what we do. So we follow this methodology. So again, you can then look at, you know, um, the forms that constitutes um, the composite solid and have it decomposed so that you have a clear idea in terms of what equations you need to use. So the bottom part represents a larger um, cuboid. The upper part here, that upper segmented form represents a cube. So again, you use the area, um, the, 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 the equation in calculating the volume of the cube. And we've got this triangular hole, or this triangular protrusion. So again, you use the equation in calculating a triangular prism. However, since you're taking away material, we assume that the volume will be negative because you're subtracted from the object. And any material that's more of an addition in defining the form, that will be seen as being positive. So another area where students can make mistakes. So be very careful. If you've got holes and um, cutouts within um, a solid form, assume the volume to be negative. And the opposite will be positive. So again, using coordination. So you've all done orthographic projection, so you can use that as um, your means in identifying um, what the likely uh, positions would be in terms of the centroids for the individual forms. So you can look at the plan view, and since from the plan view the object is symmetrical, the central position of all the forms will rest at its bearing. So by doing that, that makes it very easy to define where the global coordinate would be in terms of X and Y. So by doing that, we have 40 in terms of X, 40 in terms of Y. So the challenge is to identify where the global uh, coordinate would be for Z. So we're going to first look at... We're going to first look at... Um, I just had to pause to um, have me disappear. So we're going to look at the object in terms of um, Z and Y and look at the position from the Y axis, uh, from the Z axis to the individual centroid position of the form. So by doing that, that reads 40 millimeters. And since it's, um, the objects are symmetrical in this plane, that makes it easy for us to identify that the positions in terms of the individual forms from the Z axis will all read 40 millimeters. However, when we're reading from the Y axis to the individual central positions, we realize that they are fairly displaced. So we can call the central position from Y to the individual segment of the triangular prism to be Z TP. So TP is just a subscript representing uh, triangular prism. Then in terms of the large cube, so that would be CLC in terms of the centroid, the Z is defined by Z subscript LC. And in terms of the small cube, that will be represented by ZSC. So using diagrams like so makes it easy for us to identify where the centroid positions are likely to be.
So we can use a simple table. So we've got uh, three columns. So one column represents you know, the segmented solid form or section. So the small cube, the large cube, and the triangular prism. The centroid of the form. So again, we can use this to calculate the centroid position of the forms individually by using uh, the bisectors from the corners to establish where the central position is like to be respect to that particular plane. So here we're looking at the, the shape of form respect to Z and Y. So by using the provided dimensions, that gives us these values. So in terms of uh, looking for Z, we've got 20, 40 and 14.43. Okay, so again, you can use the standard formula as I've sh shown you previously. So don't forget that, you know, for a square, it was the side divided by two. For a cuboid, it was the length divided by two. And for a trapezium, where it has a triangle, that will be a third of the height. And you now look at the distance from the x axis respect to, from the x axis with respect to z. So this would be in terms of the smaller cube, 80 plus the central position, Z subscript LC is equal to 40, because again, from the base to the large, doesn't really make any difference. There's no additional distance with respect to that. And for ZTP, so that's the central position with respect to TP, that'll be equal to this individual central position plus 25. So if you go back to the diagram, you realize that to get to this position, you need to at 25 plus the central position to get to the exact position of where the centroid is in respect to the x-axis. Okay. So once we do the computation, this is what we have. So this is what we just calculated. So from the x-axis to CTP, so that's the central position of uh, the triangular prism, that measures 39.43. The centroid from the x-axis to the large cuboid, that's equal to 40 millimeters. And from the x-axis to the smaller cube or cuboid, that's given as a hundred millimeters. Use diagrams effectively to enable you calculate the distances to the centroid positions. So again, if you're smart, you use a table similar to this. Now, what makes it very easy at this point is that we're assuming that the material that constitutes the form is homogeneous throughout. So the density of segment one, the density of segment two, the density of segment three are more or less the same. So as a result, we can use the equation in terms of predicting the centroid in terms of its volume. So we calculate the central, the area of the cube, the large cube, and the prism, and this is what we have. So area of a square is similar to area of a rectangle, length times width, like with the large cuboid, and for the triangle, that will be half base times height. So you use the appropriate um, values provided in the question to work out what the area will be. And to work out the area, this is what we have in terms of millimeters. So the small cube, sectional area is equal to 1,600, large cube, 6,400. And as I stated, because the prism is a cutout, you assume that to be negative. That'll be negative 1,082.5. Now that you know that, you then multiply the height or the extruded, the extruded length to the area to give you the volume. So we do that for all forms, and these are the values that we will get. So 64,000 millimeters squared for the small cube, 512,000 for the larger cube, and minus 86,600 for the prism. And once you've done that, you then add all the volumes together to give you the total volume for the form. And that adds up to 489,400 millimeter cube. 
We know what the centroid positions are. So again, we can use the centroid positions to calculate the first moment with respect to the individual volumes. So by multiplying the volume by the central, uh, the central coordinate as measured, that will give you the first moment for the form. So we multiply the small cube by its uh, centroid distance as measured from x, so that'll be 100. We do likewise for the large cube and likewise for the prism. And this is what we get. So for the small cube, 6.4 times 10 to the power 6 millimeters cubed. Large cube, 20.48 times 10 to the power 6. And the prism would give a first moment of volume at minus 3.415 times 10 to the power 6. And you've add everything together, you get the total moment to be equal to 23 thousand no sorry it's twenty three million four hundred and sixty five thousand millimeters cube so now that we have all that information we're now ready to calculate the centroid coordinate for in terms of z so that we equal to the first moments of area first moment of volume with respect to z divided by the total volume of the part that'll be equal to 23 million four hundred and sixty five thousand divided by the total volume which was given as four four hundred and eighty nine thousand and four hundred if you do the division we get the x coordinate to be equal to 47.95 approximately millimeters and there you go so that gives you the coordinates for the centroid of the solid form. And there you go. So fairly straightforward if you follow the given methodology. Using diagrams to show exactly where the centroid position ends for the composite. And there you go. Bye, bye, bye.